today is going to be a day where I'm not going to look at all the slides. There are 50 of them. Many of them are summarising. You might be annoyed now, but you'll love them when it comes to preparing your notes at the end of the semester. So I particularly want to talk about some tricky commercial situations, um, which might seem funny because we've got the presumption of a commercial relationship means that we're assuming that there's a contract. So it's actually rare that commercial people don't want their terms to be binding, but it does happen. So particular issue is with what are called letters of comfort. Has anybody ever dealt with a letter of comfort? You look a bit stressed, like it's just no. Have you dealt with one? No? It's just that concept isn't there. Yeah, <laughs> an uncomfortable concept. Good. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for that because um, sometimes, particularly when I work with the MBAs, talk about a letter of comfort. Oh, dude, yeah, letter of comfort. They've got no friggin' idea what I'm talking about, but none of them want to admit it. So then we don't get to talk about it until it gets really embarrassing. So there you go. Sorry, Matt. Matt. I was so going to call you David. Matt. <laughs> I'm. I would like to say, I reckon by the end of the semester, I will know more names than anybody else in the room. I am prepared to have a go at that. But so I am embarrassed though at not knowing your name at week six. I'm trying very hard. So, Matt. Yes. You were about to say something. No, I wasn't. I, I'm, also, I'm also uncomfortable. Lacking comfort. With, with, with letters of comfort. Okay, does anybody feel comfortable with honour clauses? Okay. Clauses. Okay, let's talk. I'll give you some general principles and then we'll talk about um, letters of comfort in particular. So, first principle an agreement to agree cannot be binding. So, if I say, if, if you and I enter into an agreement, we were just talking a minute ago and your name's gone out of my head. Danny. Danny. Okay, I don't think it was in my head to start <laughs> off with. So, Danny, how do you do? How about next week we agree uh, what we're going to call you? Okay, we'll come in next week, we'll agree that. And could that be a binding agreement, other than the fact it's a ridiculous subject matter? No, it could not. One of the things, and we'll talk about it more when we get to certainty next week, but we need to know what it is we agree. When we think about what an agreement is, the offer needs to contain what I like to call the DNA of the deal. We need to have, in order for an offer to be an offer, it needs to contain all of the things that mean that just by accepting it, an agreement would be made. Which means it needs to be able to identify what the consideration is, it needs to be able to identify what the significant terms are. Um, and so we can't agree in the future, we can't agree to agree something in the future. Uh, when I say we can't, people do it all the time. Often where I see it is uh, in standard agreements, say an agreement for the supply of computer software to a company and the development's going to happen over a period of time and then it will say, and if we're having a dispute about what any of, uh, or how much things will cost, um, then the parties will get into a room and they'll reach agreement. <laughs> see it all the time. Um, you see it in relation to buildings in particular. If the parties are having a disagreement about what kind of cladding to put on the outside of their office tower, we'll get in a room and we'll agree it. Um, usually not written like that. It's usually written in a fancy way so the lawyers get paid, but it's uh, effectively an agreement to agree. So that will never be binding. So we'll talk about it more in certainty, but it we end up in this situation where people want to enter into some kind of arrangement but they don't know enough about the future yet to work out exactly what they're going to need to reach agreement about. Or they want to see how something else turns out. So I agree to pay you a million dollars subject to me getting finance on terms I'm happy with. 
But if I don't get that, then I might be paying you $900,000. So sometimes we need to get these preliminary agreements in place before we can actually be certain. Rose, Frank and Crompton is a good example of an honour clause. I thought I had the slides in a different order, but let's do honour clauses first. So an honour clause is effectively a statement where a commercial person says, this is what I intend and this is what I expect will happen, but I'm telling you right up front, I don't intend to be bound by it. This is not something that you can sue me on. So Rosen Frank was a sale agent. Uh, so sale agents basically arrange for the buying and sa selling of stock. They're like real estate agents, only stock agents instead. Um, and so they had an ongoing relationship and they had a document where they said they would continue their present arrangements. And one of the clauses in that document said, this isn't a formal or a legal arrangement, it's just a record of intention to which and the words were used, they honourably pledge themselves with mutual loyalty and friendly cooperation. So, and it's a long-term arrangement. So they're saying, this is how we do things, this is the kind of prices that we charge, we're going to continue to do it in this particular way, but it's... we're honourably pledging ourselves with mutual loyalty and friendly cooperation. But, Crompton, terminated the arrangement. Rose Frank said, hang on a minute, we've built our business, we've employed people, we've done things on the assumption that you were going to continue being our customer over this period of time. We've even put together this document that says that we're going to do things in a particular way. The court said, well, no, that's an honour clause. It couldn't really be a lot clearer. We're documenting how it is that we intend to do business now and right now we've got no reason to think it would change, but things changed and they've been very clear that they had no ongoing intention of being bound. Um, but, but once an agreement is binding, the parties cannot exclude the court's jurisdiction. This is important to understand too. So where, as I mentioned, the, the places I see it is, if we've got a dispute, what we'll do is we'll get into a room and we'll agree an outcome. Now, when those clauses say, and the parties have to agree an outcome, uh, because uh, it, you know, when we agree that we won't bring any of our disputes before a court, that is not an enforceable provision. So, an agreement will be either enforceable because there is intention, um, and carving out part of it and saying, but we won't, we won't deal with disputes in front of the court, will be unenforceable. Or the document will on its face say, we don't intend for this to be enforceable. And as a consequence, it's not an enforceable agreement. But the courts will never find a clause that says that the parties exclude the jurisdictions of courts enforceable. So let's talk about letters of comfort. So I'm going to take you into a scary commercial space now. It's okay. It will be fine. Um, sometimes people need to borrow money. Um, and usually when other people lend them money, they want some sort of security to ensure that they get their money back. So a scenario you'd be familiar with is you want to buy a house. In order to buy a house, you need to borrow money, usually from a bank. Um, the bank says, I will lend you money on these terms. They include, you will pay me interest. So the consideration for the promise to lend money is the promise to pay interest. And you will grant a security interest over that property. And so the security interest, usually a mortgage, means that if you cease paying your mortgage payments and the bank decides to do this thing, technically it's called foreclose, then the bank can come in, take possession of the asset, put it on the market, sell it even. It then takes the amounts of money that 
you owe it out of the money that it has raised from the sale and then you or your other creditors get the balance. Okay, it's, a, a lot of people tend to think that the bank owns the house and while you pay it off and so if you don't pay it off then they can sell it and you lose your house. Technically, yes, you lose your house but the rest of the money still belongs to you. If, and there's, that's why banks only lend you a percentage, not the whole amount. Well, unless you're in Western Australia, perhaps. Sorry, we have people in Western Australia. I don't know why I'm bagging you today. Um, or you're a lawyer and they give you way too much money, which seems to happen a bit as well. Uh, so, but sometimes companies who, uh, or people who are borrowing money don't have a nice, fat, physical asset like a house. They've got businesses and other things that are going on. So the banks are looking for security. So I'm just wondering if I've got, I'm pretty sure I haven't got a whiteboard marker here today. No, I don't. I might just try and, no, it's gonna to be too hard. I'm gonna use my hands, which is not gonna be helpful. Um, no, I won't try, oh, you, oh. You're a very nice man. I should do this on the screen for the recording would be better. Thank you. Um, so, okay, I'm going over here. So we've got a company. I know you haven't done company law yet. I don't know why companies are always square. Um, the company is owned by people, right? These are the shareholders. But sometimes they're owned by other companies as well, right? So that's what happens. So just don't worry about how that works, but these are called shareholders and they own a company. A company then does business. Now many companies, they're just one company and they just go and they do their business. They earn profits. After they pay all of their employees and staff, they take the profits and they pay them back up to shareholders, easy enough. But sometimes they own other companies that do other bits of their business for them. Okay. Now, just trust me on this. Um, you will learn about it in company law. But one of the key reasons why people form companies is so, and I'm misquoting some judge from a million years ago, so gentlemen can take risks with other gentlemen's money. <laughs> a company is basically, so you will have seen that limited or PTY LTD from time to time. Um, limited effectively means that the shareholders' risk is limited to the amount of paid up capital in the company. So effectively, all of these shareholders have paid some money and that money is now a pool of assets that belongs to the company. Um, if the company continues to grow, they can then buy and sell shares between them, which might be worth more or less than the amount of money that they put in in the first place. But that pool of money then they, it gets invested, reinvested, and it grows in theory, but sometimes it goes down. So if it goes down and there's nothing left, then basically these guys get nothing, but anybody who is owed money doesn't get anything either, right? It's like it's... it's quarantine into the company. That's what limited is. For those who are interested, the PTY limited, proprietary limited, just means the ownership is limited. So the directors can decide who the shareholders are. The, if you want to sell your shares, you can only sell them to somebody that the director approves. Anyway, you can tell I'm an M&A lawyer, can't you? This is much more in my space. So then basically, we're talking about situations here where we've got a subsidiary company here that has been formed to do a particular thing. And in the cases we're going to look at, it's a high risk thing. The high risk thing that these company, this company was going to do is tin mining or zinc mining or foreign exchange or something like that. Where So you might put in, we could give them a billion dollars and they might spend it all overnight and be kaput. Or tomorrow morning, they might have $10 million instead. So it's all being, this company here, the ownership company, is containing its risk. So what often happens if we've got a bank, I don't know why banks always seem to look like this, don't they? So there's a bank who's negotiating to lend some money to this company to do something. And it says, oh, 
you know, a really high risk thing. I don't know how comfortable I feel with this high risk thing. I want some security. And they say, well, we haven't got anything. We've just got a business plan. You're going to lend us some money. What can we do? And they say, well, you've got a big fat parent company. This is, we tend to use this language. The one at the top is the parent. The ones down the bottom are subsidiaries. Uh, it'd be so easy if we just called them children, wouldn't it? So these are subsidiary companies. So the subsidiary says to the parent, can you give me some support? And now think about it commercially. What the parent is saying, well, actually, the whole reason why I've created a separate company to do that risky business is I don't want it to affect my other awesome businesses off in these other places. So if you go broke, I want to be able to quarantine it and cut it off at that point, OK? So effectively, these are cases where the, the parent company has said, I won't give you security, I won't give you a guarantee or an indemnity, we've spoken about those before, but I will give a letter of comfort. And that's literally what it does. I will make the bank comfortable, so that's some sort of agreement between the bank, sorry I'm standing between you here, between the bank and the parent company that says, this is my baby and I will protect it and look after it. Okay, so that's all a letter of comfort is, but we've got to work out whether they're binding or not. So, thank you very much for that. Sorry, that is not at all helpful to you online. I'll try and do a version of that. I'll try and animate it when I'm doing it. What am I saying? I'm flying tomorrow to Vietnam. That is not going to happen before these uh, recordings are out, especially as I've just realised the first part of tonight didn't record, it crashed. So. We've got a security, so a reason for guarantee. And I know, look, that's a little bit long-winded, but I want you to understand why, because I think the rest of it will make a lot more sense if you understand why. So now on the slide pack, let me show you how one of these work. Now, uh, any of you heard of a bloke called Christopher Scase? I'm sure they made TV movies about him, like so the older ones among us will remember him well. So Christopher Scase uh, was an entrepreneur, shall we say, let's start there. And he was um, the key shareholder behind a company called Spedley. Um, at one stage, he and Spedley, directly or indirectly, controlled Channel 7, a um, number of mining enterprises. Uh, you know, he was a big man around town, shall we say. Um, until it all went pear-shaped. So this was in the 80s. Um, another company, since gone to God, called a &I, Australian National Industries, um, it actually owned 45% of Spedley Holdings. So Spedley, in my original diagram, a &I was a part owner of Spedley. So in that diagram that I've got up there, it's one of the companies that is a shareholder, but there were mum and dad shareholders. So Christopher Scase basically controlled uh, the majority of that company. So Spedley Holdings then had a subsidiary company, a child company. It owned 100% of that company. It was called Spedley Securities. Spedley Securities traded in, or was it, um, I think it actually did hedge fund uh, trading, can't remember off the top of my head, hedge fund trading, and it borrowed, I always want to go, five million dollars. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like a lot of money anymore. But in 1987 or so when they borrowed the money, no, probably earlier than that, it was a lot of money. Uh, so they borrowed five million dollars from Bank Brussels. And when it loaned the money, it, a, it, Bank Brussels asked a &I for a letter of comfort. Sorry, I can't remember what I've got on my next slide. Let, sorry, let me flip through because I just want to work out what I've said. Yep, good. So the letter of comfort had two relevant terms. I was trying to work out whether I had to remember them or if I'd put them on a slide. One of them was, it said, this is a and I, it is our practice to ensure that our affiliate, Spedley Securities, will at all times be in a position to meet its financial obligations as they fall due, number one. Number two, it said, 
effectively, if we stop being a substantial shareholder, so if we reduce our ownership in Spedley below that 45%, we'll give you 90 days notice. Now that's a little bit of a fraught and a kind of funny promise really because I don't know, any of you share, uh, share traders, punters on the stock exchange? Probably don't need to be to think about this. If you've got, I mean A&I was a household name at the time, it was a solid company. So imagine, imagine there's a company that makes uh, computer screens and it's 45% owned by Apple Computer. And you've invested in that uh, company that makes computer screens. And then you hear that Apple are selling it. Do you think that the price of that company that makes computer screens and is 45% owned by a big computer screen manufacturer, uh, user, um, do you think the price of that share is likely to go up or down? Down. So the stock exchange has rules that say if you're going to do something that might have a material impact on the price of a share that ordinary punters wouldn't know about, then you have to tell the market. Okay, it's a little bit more complex than that and those of you who do M&A with me at some stage will get to learn about that rule in some details. But basically, you can't tell a bank 90 days before you dump a stock that you're going to dump the stock without actually manipulating the market. So I don't actually know how they thought that they could have kept that promise in the first place. So surprise, surprise, they didn't. They dumped the stock, the price went down, Spedley went broke, Spedley, so Spedley Holdings went broke, Spedley Securities went broke, Bank Brussels was short its $5 million plus some interest, and it said, hang on a minute, you gave us a letter of comfort. And that letter of comfort, you said it was your practice to make sure that your affiliate would meet its financial obligations as and when they fall due, which means you should have made that happen and you didn't. And secondly, you said you were gonna give us 90 days notice if you dumped the stock and you didn't, so we're gonna sue you for breaching the terms of the letter of comfort. So what do we think about that? It says it's a letter of comfort. It says I'm not going to give you, they were asked for a security and they didn't give a security. They wouldn't give a guarantee or an indemnity. They just made these kind of somewhat nebulous promises. One of them is, it's not even a promise to pay the bank, it's just to, it's, is it even a promise? Think about it. I mean, you decide. It's our practice to ensure that our affiliate can pay its bills as and when they fall due. I'm going to move this along because we're going to run out of time. Court said, yeah, actually, you made a promise. Now, the 90 days is particularly relevant here because why do you think that the bank wanted that 90 days? Because if uh, they gave notice under that clause, that gave the bank time to either, to make a decision basically, to call its loan, to deal with what it was going to do, to take steps to ensure that it was protected before the shareholding changed and it lost that other support. So the Oh, I thought this slide would tell me this. But uh, so the questions here before the court were whether there was an intention that the letter itself would create a legal relationship and whether the terms were sufficiently promissory in nature to be contractual. So look at them again. They don't have a typical I will do this if that happens kind of promise. It's just a, it's our practice to ensure that our affiliate can pay its debts. Doesn't say how, doesn't say it's going to provide money, doesn't say anything like that. Whoops, wrong way. Oh. So, the court said in relation to intention that the starting point is a prima facie presumption that in commercial transactions there's an intention to enter into a legal relationship. 
and the onus of proving the absence of an intention rests with the party who asserts that no legal effect was intended. So in other words, when reading the letter, it's appropriate for the court to read it on the basis that it was written by people who intended to be bound, where there's no express statement to the contrary. So they held that if the statements are promissory in character, court should enforce them when uttered in the course of business and when there is no clear indication that they're not intended to be legally enforceable. The letter that a &I gave included enforceable contractual promises to provide notice of its intention to dispose of the interest and to ensure that Spedley Securities would be in a position to pay the bank. And the bank was entitled to damages as a consequence. So let's have a look at another decision. This is a UK decision the same year. And I want you to think about whether this is different law or something else. So this is Kleinwort Benson and Malaysia Mining Corp. So MMC, big miner, you would have seen uh, its logo all over the place. Um, so after some very lengthy negotiations where Kleinwort Benson asked MMC a number of times uh, to provide security, they agreed that a holding company would give a letter of comfort that said, it is our policy to ensure that the subsidiary is at all times in a position to meet its liabilities to you. So not identical, but very, very similar wording to Spedley. In this case, it's actually a less complex structure. MMC is uh, the 100% shareholder of metals. Metals was set up to trade on the London Tin Exchange. So it was specifically set up to take on that risk. We've got a million quid loan facility from Kleinwort Benson to the metals company. There's also an agreement between Benson and, or Kleinwort Benson and MMC, MMC's overriding uh, treasury or facility for the group but there's a separate loan arrangement for uh, the parent company and, uh, sorry, for MMC Metals. Um, and there are two letters of comfort. So the two letters of comfort have that same terminology in it. They're very, very similar. No need, clearly, for the 90-day get out of jail free card because it's 100% owned, potentially. Uh, but, so it didn't have that clause, but it had everything else that's very similar. In that case, oh, sorry, these are just facts. Tin market collapsed and metals owned all of the 10 million quid. Not surprisingly, MMC said, yeah, we, that's a letter of comfort. We put that business into a separate entity so we could contain our loss. Uh, you probably shouldn't have been advancing them the full facilities in a, such a volatile market. Um, so in the first instance, the court found that commercial people intend their agreements to be binding and so the letter should be binding. But on appeal, it was held that the letter didn't contain any contractual undertaking. It was really a statement of fact, that it only carried with it a moral obligation on the part of MMC. So we've got absolutely the opposite result on appeal. So are they inconsistent? Maybe not really, because the first one only went the other way because they didn't actually end up... Like, if they were only awarded damages for the breach of contract, they weren't held liable for the whole debt, right? Uh, but the damage... We don't need to assess damages here, but damages are... They weren't liable for the debt. That's absolutely... That's a good observation. Uh, but the damages represented the loss that the bank suffered by the amount out. But so uh, it's very tempting to go to the damages claim. You're thinking like a lawyer, that's the good thing. But at the moment, we have to rein ourselves back and think about the principles. But I agree with you that they're not, they're not inconsistent judgments. Um, I would go to the 90 days, though, in particular. So the 90 days is part of that demonstration of I'm making this promise so that you can sort yourself out. 
where there was no corresponding promise of that sort. So again, it's just a good way of looking at the objective test and we can, you will see this over and over again that we'll look objectively at really similar situations but it'll only be one little thing that turns it around in each case. Okay, questions, concerns, frustrations. Do you feel more comfortable with what a letter of comfort is? Good. Ken? Why wouldn't they clearly state there is no moral, I mean, there's no, they don't intend to be bound, or they didn't know that at the time? Uh, again, yeah, it's, it is, you would definitely do it now. There is, there is no way these days if you absolutely, if, if MMC wouldn't be putting big header on the top of this letter of comfort, um, this is not binding. There, we are, do not intend to be bound by this. This is given in honour or comfort only. And then the parties would smash it out in negotiations and it would end up somewhere. Um, but of course these cases have been decided since. The other thing is, Partic yeah, London is the financial capital of the world for a really, really long time. Um, and, well, financial capital of the Western world, I should say. Um, and really, even though that pretty much started to peter away from the end of the Second World War, um, it took a long time for the British to kind of realise that. And there are a number of things where just certain things you just wouldn't sue your bank. You know, banks, you didn't sue a bank. That's just, you know, gentlemen don't sue their bank. That's just crass. Like, why would you do that? So there's a number of these things took a little bit longer to come out than you would otherwise expect. We get the law from the cases we get, from the disputes that we see. Um, and the good thing about all of this is when you do see those disputes, it that can inform the rest of us. One of the things that is happening more and more now, which is really difficult for contract lawyers who are trying to document complex transactions, we have all these new transactions that we never expected. So stuff involving cryptocurrency or international uh, trade and commerce uh, using technology and um, artificial intelligence and all sorts of changes in the world and these are all being negotiated and no doubt contracts are being fought over all the time but they're being mediated or they're being arbitrated offshore and the results are a secret. And so bizarrely as the world gets more open um, we become more and more dependent on you know, the ten guys in ivory towers who are negotiating those agreements and who know what the consistent commercial outcomes are. So, anyway, there's enough of me sermonising for today. Um, with your permission, I want to pop to preliminary agreements because as a strategic matter for you, understanding Masters in Cameron is a really important thing for you to do. Um, if we don't actually cover off uh, the government stuff. Um, I believe or remember that there is a desk lecture about that, um, but it is less key to what it is that you need to do. And I haven't written it yet, but preliminary agreements often come up in the uh, next assignment, but you've got a few days before you have to worry about that. So where parties have negotiated principal terms of a proposed transaction, then they can enter into a preliminary written agreement. So sometimes that might be called a term sheet or a heads of agreement or it might even be called a preliminary agreement. And for those of you who are interested, um, one of the things that you have access to is the um, Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents, which is one of the databases that's available to you as university scholars. Um, and Effectively, that's just a big precedent library. So here I'm using precedent in the, t the way that a law firm uses the term precedent as opposed to the way that academics or judges use the term precedent. So precedent means something that went before, right, technically. So precedence in the sense I'm using it here, it's a word you hear all the time, it's template or example documents. So you can actually go into that database and you can have a look at an example letter of comfort or an example 
non-disclosure agreement or an example real estate contract or a contract for the sale and purchase of business. And I would recommend in your abundant amounts of spare time that you have a go at doing that. Think of some transaction or some sort of contract that you're interested in and see if you can find an example of what a contract might look like because it will be good for the way of thinking that you have. So preliminary agreements, um, uh, one that it's very likely that you might be looking for an example of one of those in the second assignment. Um, often a preliminary agreement is expressed to be subject to contract. So in other words, that this is just our opening gambit, this is our general set of terms, but it's subject to the contract that our lawyers are going to put together for us. Um, now, Anna, you're in real estate, aren't you? You do conveyancing yeah. stuff. So you would see uh, subject to finance quite regularly, yes? Yeah, it's quite common. Yeah, so have you seen any term sheet or what do they tend to be called? When the, when the vendor and the purchaser have basically agreed the key terms, uh, so things like price and how long the settlement period will be and whether any fixtures need to be, can be taken away or need to be fixed or things like that. Yeah, like they, if they, like our clients go for a big deal to buy something, they usually have this head of agreement to say Heads of, yep. subject to like a seven days due diligence search, yep. that sort of thing. So basically a heads of agreement will say, yeah, I'm, effectively the parties have They've reached a meeting of the minds on the key terms. Yes, at least they reached that. Yeah. They are happy with the price. And so, it's, so we know what the price is. And, and it's kind of, you think about it as chicken and egg. If I want to spend, I don't know, you guys, I say $5 million. I want to spend $5 million on a development. And I always find this funny because the more money you're spending on the development, the more likely you are to be penny pinching on how much you're going to spend on your lawyers. So, but before I actually commit to spending five grand on my lawyers to go and put a contract together and do the searches and everything, before we do that, I want to know that the vendor is going to meet me at the price. Because I don't want to go and spend that money and then only to hear the vendor say, well, you know, I'm not going to sell it to you for less than six million dollars. So it's kind of makes sense that the parties will reach this preliminary phase before either of them will go off and spend any money on getting advice or getting things done. It's so often where they can do themselves the most damage. Um, and they'll often do this heads of agreement thing where they will agree, I'm the vendor, I agree, I'll sell it to you for $5 million, I won't talk to any other potential purchasers for the next seven days, you do your due diligence and then we'll get a contract together. Is that likely to be binding, just how I've described it? We already know there could be an issue with consideration. Now, again, it's an honour system. Often, people who are selling developments at $5 million a pop, they don't want it to get out in the market that as soon as somebody comes along with, you know, $5 million and two dollars that they're going to break a contract and they're going to get out of it, right? So there's often this kind of commercial reasons why people stick into these agreements. But again, a heads of agreement, it'll go to a question of objective testing as to whether or not it's actually a binding agreement or not. Some of them will say, parties don't intend to be bound by this. Some of them will say, we won't be bound by anything other than clause three, which says, got to keep it confidential or says that um, you've got, I'll keep it exclusive for seven days or whatever is important. So each time it's going to be important to work out is this preliminary agreement where we're contemplating some kind of formal contract later, is that going to be binding or not? So Masters and Cameron is our key case here, goes back to 1954 and it categorised preliminary agreements of three types. So the first is where the parties have finalised the terms and they intend to be bound immediately, but they're going to get some sort of formal document written. So I'm just going to, I hope you don't mind Anna, I'm going to use your example here. So I've got a heads of agreement, um, I'm 
a vendor, I've agreed with Matt that I'm going to uh, sell it to him for $5 million and he's agreed that that's going to happen. I've agreed I'll stay exclusive for seven days. He's going to do all of his due diligence. Oh, maybe, he's, no, in this case, he's done his due diligence already. We're just going to get the paperwork drawn up. Nothing else, OK? So the intention is we're bound now, but we're going to replace it with some more fulsome words. And particularly in something like real estate, that's quite common because real estate contracts don't tend to vary significantly in the terms. You use a standard form arrangement for buying and selling things to a large extent. So these kind of contracts are binding whether or not a more formal document is signed. So on that particular arrangement, if it turned out we never actually got a formal agreement drawn up, chances are subject of course to the formalities rule which we'll get to later but chances are that that would be binding under Masters and Cameron. The next kind of category you have is that we've reached agreement on terms but performance is conditional on the execution of a formal document so it is subject to contract. So again our arrangement might be yeah we've agreed the price we've agreed the terms etc but it's subject to signing off on the formal arrangement. In those cases, despite what I said earlier, that you can't have an agreement to agree, the parties will be bound to execute the final contract. If the final contract reflects the substantive agreement that the parties have already entered into, then they are bound to sign it and our agreement is effectively on foot. And then the third category is there is no intention to be bound unless and until the parties execute a formal contract. And in that case, it won't be binding. So in Masters and Cameron, anybody read Masters and Cameron? Which of the categories did it fit into in Masters and Cameron? So the wording in the clause was, this agreement is made subject to the preparation of formal contract of sale, which shall be acceptable to my solicitors. So there was a preliminary agreement with that language on the top. So let's go through the categories. Is it that the parties have finalised the terms and intend to be bound immediately? No. no. It's subject to something else happening. Is it an agreement on terms, but performance is conditional on the execution of a formal document? Yeah. So it's also, it does refer to this third party, the terms that are acceptable to my solicitor. The court found that that wasn't adding in additional terms. They're the standard terms that they expected to be in there. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where they ended up. Um, Borkham Hills, courts have suggested that there could be a fourth category where the parties uh, intend to be bound immediately and exclusively while expecting to make a further contract in substitution for the first contract containing by consent additional terms. I'm not smart enough to understand how that's different from the second category. I'm lucky enough that there are a few academic scholars who are also, like me, don't really get how it's particularly different. I think it's just a better and more fulsome explanation of the second category. Um, but there's no doubt about it, you guys are likely to be smarter than me, so you'll understand it. Um, so in such situations, the parties would be bound by the preliminary agreement, so it fits in it's very similar to the second category. A couple of recent cases in this area. Masters and Cameron is cited a lot. Um, as a bit of a research tip, if you're trying to work out, if something reminds you of a case in an assignment and you're trying to work out how it might apply, having a look at whether or not that case has been cited subsequently will give you some idea of what what's happening in that area of the law and for those of us who lack um, um, originality, you might even find the case that's been plagiarised in the creation of a, um, an assignment task. Not saying that I'd ever do that, 
more than once or twice a year. Um, so, well established the question of whether the parties intended to bind themselves to a contract is to be determined objectively, having regard to intention disclosed by the language the parties have employed. In cases such as the present, which do not depend on the construction of one document, what is involved is the objective determination of the question from the communications between the parties in the, their context and the parties' dealings over time leading up to the making of the alleged contract. So even if the preliminary arrangement is not just one document or not any document, it's an exchange of emails or text messages or even phone calls when we don't have a formalities problem, uh, then that can be relevant. Um, and just to say, Car, as well, for an agreement, either oral or in writing, to be binding, the parties must manifest an intention to create legal intentions. Nothing new there. This requires making the objective assessment of the state of affairs between the parties as distinct from identification of any subjective reservation or intention. All right, can you bear with me for another five minutes? Oh, Ken, sorry, question? So how is this um, different from like a conditional contract in terms of you make this contract as binding ex um, Subject to finance yeah, or, or, whatever. Subject or whatever. It's not. It's another way. It's a preliminary agreement, so a class of agreement. But we do have this difference between a condition precedent and a condition subsequent. So if we have a condition precedent, a true condition precedent is a condition precedent to an agreement being made. So we will only have an agreement when this condition is fulfilled. So a good example of that might be where we say the third category. We've reached, we know what the core terms are going to be, but we have no intention of being mutually bound until we have a formal agreement, subject to contract. So a condition precedent to our agreement is the agreement being in place. An uh, example of a condition subsequent that often happens is subject to finance. So I've agreed with you that I will sell you this chair subject to you obtaining suitable finance by the end of the month. So our, we've made an agreement, if I sell the chair to somebody else before that time period is up and you're happy to either waive the finance condition because it's in your favour or to um, you've got suitable finance, you can sue me because we've made an agreement and it's, and it's a condition subsequent. So they're, I don't know if that was your original question, but they're very interrelated. It's a short answer. Okay, let me see where we're up to. Oh, actually, yeah, I liked this, which I came across not long ago. I just like this expression that I thought I'd just bring to your attention. It comes from Again, when I do my prep for these classes, one of the things that I do is go and look at whether the key cases have been cited more recently. Um, and so this one came up a couple of years ago um, in doing a citation search. So Australian Medico Legal Group and uh, Clary Mossman ask what is the meaning of what the parties have said rather than what did the parties mean to say? I think actually that's a good catchphrase to have in your head. I need to get it in mind when I'm trying to explain what objective tests are. So back to the end, we'll back around to the beginning. This is what I think is important in this topic. Comes down to these really two key things. Um, there are presumptions, but they have very limited value anymore. They really just go since Hermogenes to who has to prove that there was or there wasn't a contract in this case. And secondly, understanding those categories in Masters and Cameron and how they apply is really just a nuanced version of this objective test that we keep coming back to. So, 
We will have a toot on Sunday night. It'll be Sunday afternoon for me. I will be in Vietnam. I'm really hoping where I'm staying has good Wi-Fi. We will do a problem like we did last week. Uh, we will work through a problem in a similar way, which is an intention-based one. Um, I am very much hoping I will get recordings out tomorrow, but actually you're here so you don't care about recordings and the people who are listening to me don't... I mean, they can't hear that I want to get them out until after they're out, so I won't bother boring you with that. Have a good week, everybody. Remember, no class next week, no toot Sunday week. You have a week off. And for those of you who can, have a week off. Have a week <laughs> off. I know it's only been six weeks since we started, but it's... It's, you know, you've been in the fire hydrant, so be kind to yourself. You will appreciate it later on because it, you might think it's only six weeks, but then you'll have exams and you won't be able to have your time off then, okay?